Welcome to Women Read Scripture. I'm Mariana Richardson. And I'm Annette Marie Lantos Tilleman Dick. And we are in the exciting part of the Acts chapters. Ooh. So much is happening. So much. And it is amazing to me as I think of Acts 10 through 15, we also have a major shift that is happening in the early Christian church where, especially in Acts 10, we're going to have Peter have this amazing revelation that's going to change the way that we do missionary work, the way that basically the members of the church come into the church. All of these wonderful things happen in these chapters. They're, they are tremendous revolutionary things that happen in the way that that the gospel as it has been brought by the Savior to this group of faithful, mostly Jewish people, is now going to move up and move out to the world. Well, and I love the fact that you bring that up because basically the church to this point is basically Jewish. Even though they're Christians, they are all members of also of the Jewish race, but also the Jewish faith bringing the two together. And and probably even more just Jews. You know, there were Jews because there were Jews that were all over the world, too, and mm -hmm. they probably had intermarried, They, but they were still faithful to this faith. This is a big thing in Judaism, is to keep the faith, as it were, no matter where you go, no matter how far you go from the center. Um, and And there are many Jews in many parts of the world who have already accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Exactly. Even today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and so I, I love the fact that we are following these footsteps that, first of all, God is not a respecter of persons. And yet this whole idea of circumcision we're going to see is a major, it's not just a, a molehill, it, it is a mountain that a lot of people are going to have to get over in terms of the fact that people can join the church without being circumcised that's that's huge it, that's going to be a problem it speaks to the to the beneficence and the humility and the sort of merciful nature of these leaders of the church who said yeah you know what we wouldn't want to do that and we shouldn't force others who have accepted to follow in this path of righteousness we shouldn't create these kinds of obstacles to faithfulness. Well, let's start with the story of Cornelius, because for me, what a faithful man. A matter of fact, as we read about him, he obviously is a centurion of the Italian band. And so what we learn from that is that he is a Roman. You know, he, he is tied and one. true. And yet he is a faithful, faithful person. And it says how he gives alms to the people and prays to God always. And a matter of fact, it's while he is praying that he gains a vision of what he is supposed to do. And actually he has an angel that comes to him and, and tells him to send some people to Peter. To which he is, his response is at first to be afraid, which I think is, there are a couple of things here. You know, I think there are a lot of leaders in our military who are also extremely faithful people. And I see, we, I think we see that archetype here in, in this centurion. Centurion would mean that he's over a hundred Roman soldiers. And it's a, it's a responsibility, as you can imagine, to keep them in line, to keep them doing what they're supposed to. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And, um, and he, though, is clearly a humble man, concerned with doing good. And I think that, that we need to appreciate how many leaders in our military, I know of a number, who are very faithful people as well, women and men. And um, I think that that's an important thing. I think the other piece is that this angel appears to him, and what does it say? It says he's afraid yeah. when he sees him, um, and um, and he and he says yes. He says he um, he saw in a vision of about the ninth hour an angel, and he looked on him and he was afraid and said, "What is it, Lord?" <laughs> and that even this centurion, a tough guy, to keep these hundred Roman 
men in line was taken aback when he oh, saw yeah. the angel. Oh, yeah. I love that. And I think I love the answer. Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And so that here was a man, he wasn't a Jew, he was obviously a Gentile, and yet God is acknowledging his prayers and acknowledging his alms unto him. And so, you know, that's kind of the preface of what Peter is going to go through. So we also have Peter who is also praying, and he also gains a vision but a very different one. Both of them must, the sincerity of their prayers is, I think, a really common element here. And I think that that is something that is very relevant to us as individuals. Sometimes, you know, we're in, sometimes we pray because we're nervous, we're this, that's, we we pray hopefully all the time, as does this, um, Corn, as does Cornelius, Cornelius who says he prays yeah, they pray continually. I think that it should be and can be a comfort to us to know that when our prayers are sincere, the Lord is aware of them. And we may not always immediately appreciate or understand the answers we get, but he is mindful of our prayers and he will answer them, sometimes in unusual ways. Well, the interesting thing, though, that happens with Peter is that Peter is not afraid. And I think a lot of that is because he's kind of used to having angels and visitations at this point. But instead, he has a very different, you know, aspect to his vision in that the the vision is that all of these beasts of the earth, all of these things that he has never touched, would never eat. And then he's commanded to rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And his response is, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Mariana, I want to just say one thing so we can keep everybody on. So Cornelius has his vision, and he is told, get some of your men and send them to this place to find this person. He has a message for you. Meanwhile, you know, Peter, just so everybody, I I know people probably have read it, but I want to make sure that they get this amazing story because Acts, if Acts is anything, it is full of great stories. Oh, definitely. And we highly recommend it. Even if it wasn't the scriptures, I would say, (laughs) oh, read this. It is amazing. But, But so these three guys then make their way to, um, I think he's in Jerusalem, is, is, is Peter in Jerusalem? He's living with... Peter's in Joppa. In Joppa, in Joppa, mm-hmm. which is not, it's little, it's beautiful area, that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they make their way there. Meanwhile, Peter is having this vision. vision. Right. This vision to which he's, <laughs> no. Well, and the point that I think is really interesting that this happens three times, Peter each time has the same response And then this is the part that I think is fascinating. He says, now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house. So he was at Simon the Tanner there in Joppa and stood before the gate and called. Now, Peter is thinking about this vision at this point and doubting what it means And then the spirit says to him, behold, three men seek thee, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. I love it. Now will come the interpretation of the dream. You know, I mean, he has this dream. I am sure that initially he thinks it's a test. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to eat those. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, and, and, and then, but to... To sort of sign, scene, to put the seal of inspiration on it, the Lord says, oh, there are three people down there looking for you. And sure enough, there they are. There are. They, there are, they are there. I think many, we, I mean, we haven't had such dramatic experiences, but probably many of us have had experiences that are sort of a shadow of this, you know, where we have thought, is this what the Lord really wants us to do? And then he, we have another inspiration and it confirms that the Lord has been inspiring us. 
Well, and I wanted to share some words by Elder Anderson, Neil L. Anderson, because he wrote very specifically about sometimes we might have experience like this that you were talking about, where the Lord gives us a thought or a feeling or something in our heart, and then we start doubting it, and we're like, okay, is that really what he wants me to do? Am I supposed to do that? And so Elder Anderson said this, when personal difficulties or world conditions beyond our control darken our path, the spiritually defining memories of our book of life are like luminous stones that help brighten the road ahead. And then that was in 2020. In April 2023, which just happened, he talked about this again, and he said, my prayer at this Easter season is that we will more consciously shape, strengthen, and secure this preeminent thought of Jesus Christ in the chambers of our soul. Our love for him does not shield us from sadness and sorrow in this mortal life, but it allows us to walk through the challenges with a strength far beyond our own. As your mind remains firmly and forever upon the thought of Jesus Christ, and as you continue to focus your life more fully on the Savior, I promise you that you will feel his hope, his peace, and his love. Hold on to your testimony. Well, I can testify to the fact that that is true and that I will add to it only that I am so grateful for the president and prophet of our church now, President Nelson, who has underscored by admonition and by the way that we've organized our study going forward in the last few years, that we immerse ourselves in the scriptures, that we have always studied the scriptures, we have always felt, but we are immersing ourselves to a greater level. And as we immerse ourselves in the scriptures, as we, as we said at the outset of our podcast, take responsibility mm-hmm. for our own learning and our own testimonies, as it were, our own understanding of what we believe and why we believe it, it is like an extraordinary, not only lifesaver, not only firm foundation, not only lights that illuminate the path, but a a sort of on the big screen, we see what our purpose is, what our life is, how the Lord has worked in the past, how he has not shielded those he loves from trauma and danger, as we certainly see in the book of Acts, but how he will be there even in the darkest moments. To me, what is particularly comforting about this is not to take the responsibility off of us for being there as as human comfort, that when you see the trauma and the trials that people in the world are being forced to endure and have been forced to endure in the past, it is good to know that the Lord can go with them into the darkest place and be there. Well, and I think along here, uh, the thing that is amazing to me is that Peter, even after all that he went through with the Savior, he is doubting himself. And so he's in kind of this this dark place where he's like, I don't understand. What is this vision going to mean? And, and it's the Lord is saying, arise, therefore, get thee down, go with him, doubting nothing. And that goes back to this idea that we have to hold on when we have doubts, when we have problems in our lives that cause us to doubt, just like Peter is at this point, that we need to hold on to those luminous stones, those stones of our testimony of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that Peter had to go through this same experience, realize that this experience for Peter is going to rock his world. You know, it truly is going to be something that is going to cause him to, exactly. And so he needs to hold on to his faith in Jesus Christ. And that wonderful experience, I mean, the Savior would constantly kind of throw things in his path, and Peter had to see them as luminous stones. And I love the fact that Peter, of course, means Petra, which means the rock. rock. That's right. And... um. Yes, and 
oh, sorry. I forgot my thought. My grand, you know, my grandfather had a great saying. My step grandfather, because my grandfather had died. But it, if you forget your thought, he'd say, "That's all right. Say something similar." Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also have this part where Peter, um, during this time that he's talking to Cornelius, and he says, "Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness." is accepted with him. For me, this is a wonderful aha moment for Peter, where he never would have gone and talked to Cornelius himself. He never would have even gone to his home. No. He never would have passed the threshold. And yet, because the Lord asked him to envision, you know, he is willing to go through this amazing experience. And then when he sees the righteousness of Cornelius and the, basically, also we see what happens is that the Holy Ghost falls upon Cornelius. And for Peter, that is a defining moment as well. So he says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So not just Cornelius, but all the people in his household that also believed in the words of Peter. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they had heard them speak with tongues and magnifying God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? It was a big dealio for these Jewish, they weren't converts. They had accepted Jesus as the Messiah, Yeshua Messiah, for whom they had been waiting for a long, 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 long time that had been prophesied and everyone knew that one day, and that, that, the, that this would be for others and that the same gifts that they had received would be liberally given to Gentiles was very hard to believe, and yet, because of his sincerity and faithfulness, P Peter understood this is what's happening. Well, and I think it's pretty powerful that when he goes back, he's you know he's coming back to Judea, and he's talking to the other people that are now strong Christians, but they are all circumcised; they are all Jews, and so Peter came to Jerusalem. And they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. I mean, they're even to the very point of why did you even go into his house, well, let alone teach them? Of course, they had not had the dream. They had not had the vision. True. They had not had the inspiration, which Peter experienced. I think it's really valuable as as individuals who are blessed to have experienced inspired understanding, to have wit personal witnesses of the truthfulness, for example, of our restored gospel, that we understand that we may have received this witness and others who are also good have not. Yeah. And that will cause them to perceive things differently. So go on, Mariana. Sorry, but I No, I think that's a wonderful that our... point. That's a wonderful point. And he goes on to say, but I witnessed the fact that they received the Holy Ghost. And they spoke in tongues. And they, they spoke in tongues, and all these amazing things happened to these people who were not circumcised. This is going to be a point of contention that we're going to see for the next few chapters it's in Acts. Deal. I mean, you know, circumcision is like fundamental must do it. Yeah. If you're a boy and you're a member uh, you're a, a member of the Jewish world that way. Well, and Jesus would have been circumcised. And so a lot of them oh, would have yes. seen this and said, Okay, but the Savior was circumcised and so he, you know, he was circumcised. Yes. Of course everybody who's a Christian should also be. And yet they're being taught something very different. And you know, even though they say that they began to call them Christians in Antioch um, I don't think that these early members of these early followers of the Savior, the first members of the church, as it were, these 120 who were gathered, you know, in, in Acts and, and, and then spread out to share the word, 
I think they really still thought of themselves as sons and daughters of Israel. I, oh, I and, do too. And they didn't, this Christian thing really was a name that was, became known, but it's sort of like different names. You know, even we as a church have known different names and different monikers, some of them thrust upon us, which like we Mormon. don't. Mormon. Mormon, but it's, you know, we didn't, we didn't rebel against the name Mormon. Right. We think of Mormon as a fantastic person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who left this incredible record for us. So people wanted to call us Mormons. Okay. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing right. in our mind. Just, nope. But, you know, it's interesting how our prophet has said it's very important very important now that we identify as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is an important piece of who we are and what we are in our identity. And so I think that some of this confusion, you know, it's hard for us sometimes to go back and put ourselves in that place. But it was understandable, let me put it that way. Well, and I love that comment because I do think that maybe that's kind of also part of the shift where the Lord did when he went up into heaven, he commanded them to preach to all the world. Now, that wasn't just to all the world, the Jews in all the world. And like you said, but with the diaspora, you know, they would But that's be, what they thought. That's what they thought. They thought and he's yeah, changing their Jews thought. All over the world, you right. know, and we've got to go to them and tell them the Messiah's come. And that's what people thought, you know, and it's, understandable that they interpreted it in that way. Oh, definitely. You know? And now I think the Lord is trying to teach them that they are now Christians. And as Christians, the Gentiles too are going to be a part of the Christian church. And they are going to be one. And they and are going to be one. that's a big deal, right? <laughs> and that's the struggle that we're talking about in these chapters. So um, let's go now to chapter 12. As I look at this because we have this interesting interplay between this tension in the church, but then also realize this new Christian faith is going through a lot of tension outside. Oh. And and a lot of that is coming from the Jews as well. Oh, yeah. So you have tension inside the church, you know, where... And the different Ju Jewish the, groups. It's just different Jewish groups. It's but you also Jewish have... Area. The, you know, this other problem, too. And if you see in chapter 12, we have the martyrdom of James. And we talked previously last week about the martyrdom of Stephen. And so realize, and, and I think this is kind of interesting, where Herod stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he picked James, the brother of John, and killed him with the sword. And then he did it because he saw it pleased the Jews. That is so important, Maria. I'm so happy you noticed this intent. You know, it's interesting because we know that Paul was there when S Stephen was martyred. Right, right. We know that Paul was going to round up those nasty followers of Jesus and right. bring them back to... But he did it because he really believed they were offending God, mm -hmm. that they were deeply they were assaulting the faith. And and I think the Lord saw Paul's, the sincerity right. of his faith and probably his ability to be effective as well. And so, you know, we have that wonderful experience on the road to to um, Damascus. But, um, but um, here it is simply for political favor. Definitely. And, you know, we see so much of it in the world. Ugh, it, it, To someone who believes public service is really a noble pursuit and was brought up to believe that, to believe that it was noble of people to be willing to serve in government where they would make much less money, but where they could use their talents to make the nation or their city or their state a better place. It is, it is so sad to see... It, to see people who only want it for power and for the the laud that they receive. And, and Herod, Herod falls is, into that oh. category. Well, and then because of the favor of the Jews, he also puts Peter in prison. Oh. 
Does now, he ever? And you can imagine how the saints are feeling at this time because Stephen's been stoned, James has been killed, now Peter is in prison, and they see the handwriting on the wall, you know, that Peter is also slated to be killed as well. And so then we have this, this interesting thing, um, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They are praying, and they are praying hard. And if you look at verse 12 and 12, and 12 um, it's interesting, too, that Peter, of course, is let go by the angels. And I think that's pretty cool. It's a that, fabulous. Let's not gloss over it. Let's not gloss good. over it. It's it is too good. good. I want, I, Mariana, something that is so important, you know, this is this incredible period for the church. They oh. are... There are Miracles. lots of converts happening, you know, thousands of people in different places, Gentiles, Jews, you name it, are listening to these first, this first band of dedicated missionaries, yeah. and they are believing them. But simultaneously, there are conflicts within the church of what people need to do, what they don't need to do, and there is a lot of pressure. And outside, from the, too. Outside, yeah. from, from, and not only from the Jews— but from the rulers who want to curry favor with the Jews. Right. So it's coming all about, I think it's helpful as we experience life itself to understand this is a condition oftentimes of many lives that are lived with sincerity and purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That there is joy, there are great victories and wonderful things, and there are challenges. And it is just important not to lose hope in the midst of it. Well, and I like to think about some of the things that we're talking about here in this early Christian church when we also talk in the Doctrine and Covenants about our early history. We see a lot of similarities between the two in that our church, too, had all kinds of persecution. Oh, yes. And our church, too, also within the church would have a lot of difficulty where oftentimes it was the members, people who had been members of the church, who were the most vehement in terms of, you know, putting people into jail and making sure that they were um, uh, hurt and tortured and everything else that happened to our poor first members, uh, you know, in our dispensation as well. Well, you know, it's interesting because Mariana and I come, I think, Mariana, you come from pretty old Mormon stock, and I am definitely new Mormon stock, though, in retroactively, you know, we have five generations now, which is Which is amazing so wonderful. Wow. Me. But there is no way that I can read Acts without over and over and over again feeling that it is such a similar history to the history of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, agree too. I think that it really impresses upon our soul. One thought about this. So the angel comes. Here's Paul. Mm -hmm. I love this. That the angel smites him. Yeah. <laughs> the angel. I love that. He, First of all, Paul is sleeping, which speaks very well for Paul that he is supposed to be killed. He's like James. Be worried. He should he's, be he worried. Should be a little, you know, anxious, but he's not that anxious. He's sleeping soundly. So the angels, you know, slap, slaps him up the side of the head. Says, "Paul, get up. Let's get going." And it's interesting because it does remind us that sometimes we need to do things in speed. The angel says, <laughs> "Get up. Put on. You got to go. Put on you your got to go. Put on your clothes. We've yeah. got to go." And they walk out, the, and then I love that the iron gate opens, opens. for them. Mm -hmm. in, apparently in Greek, the word is atomate. So it's like automatic. Oh, it's an it's automatic door. It yeah, just, it, oh, oh, <laughs> love It's that. an automatic that. door, that he, and they just walk out. And then what happens? I, well, well, no, the thing that I just love, and that's the reason why I was jumping to it, because I just think Rhoda, for me, is just a wonderful story, because <laughs> I always wonder, would I be the Rhoda? So they're in, you know, in the home. All of the saints are praying, praying, praying that Peter will be okay. And then Peter comes to the door, knocks the at the door. Appears. The angel is, and Peter then goes to this to the home door where he knows there that are they're are faithful. Right. They're and going so to be faithful. He's knocking on the door. Rhoda opens up, sees him, closes the door runs and tells people, oh, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> well, my, my, one of my daughters, Gloriana, said in her notes, she said, this reminds me a little of people who are on social media too much, oh. that they're more interested 
in posting what they've done than necessarily acting on the situation in a meaningful way. And I think there is a little bit of a lesson there. That That's an like, interesting comment. Everybody's praying. Everybody's praying. Whoa, look, he's there. Whoa, I've got to go tell everybody. <laughs> and leaves him outside. And leaves him outside. And so, um, and they said unto her, thou art mad. I mean, I'm sure they were like, what are you talking about? He's in prison. You know, it's at night. There's no way. And um, then they said, it is an angel. It is his angel. Which is interesting. Which I, I think they probably think, oh, he's been killed. Well, what I... And his angel may, is coming. Yes. You know, it, in Judaism, there is a belief in guardian angels. And so there was, a, you know, that piece that it could have been. But that makes much more sense to me. It reminds me a little bit of a very funny story in our family. Many, many, many years ago, it was 1991, we, I was working in our big old house and my kids run downstairs and mommy, Grandma Dick is on the phone. And Grandma Dick was my husband's 91-year-old grandmother. And, I, and she never called on the telephone. She wrote beautiful letters. I said, no, honeys, it's not Grandma Dick. I said, yes, mommy. I said, no, maybe it's the lady who lived with Grandma, where Grandma Dick lived. Maybe she's calling to tell us Grandma Dick died. And they said, no, mom. So I go up and I pick up the phone. Sure enough, it's Grandma Dick on the phone. And it was the same kind of thing because I did not believe them. You know, the apostles did not believe the w women who call came and told them. Right. We've seen the risen Lord, you know. And, and so even when we have faith in people, sometimes certain things just don't fit with what and that's exactly what happens possible. here it was kind of like this this great and amazing event and i have to admit i do think of this struggling church thinking that peter was going to be killed and then to have him miraculously brought back to them what a boost oh. and you can imagine right after this basically they start sending out you know, the missionaries. And so we have this great flood of missionaries that, that leave after this. And I always think the fact that it happened after Peter came back, yes. all of the members were like, okay, the Lord is in charge of this church. We can do this thing. We can do this <laughs> because the Lord is going to make sure that we are That's safe. Right. The Lord is going to make sure that I, we're okay. I want to give a postscript just on that story. So Grandma Dick, it was Grandma Dick. She said... Hi, Annette. You know, I know you've said I you always would love to have me come and stay with you. And I said, oh, yes, Grandma Dick. And he said, well, I'd like, to, I think the time has come. I'd like to do it. She was 91. Oh, wonderful. I said, well, that's great. I said, when do you think you're coming? You'd like to come. I said, tomorrow. She oh. lived in Florida and we live in Colorado. She said, yeah, I've arranged for my friend to fly with me tomorrow. So the next day she came and she lived with us until she was 103. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> what a story. It was a bit of a miracle in our lives. And That's it was incredible. a wonderful, it was a wonderful addition to our family. I, I'll put in a pitch for having your great, your grandparents and your parents live you with you when you need to, because it really does enhance your life in profound ways. Well, and then in chapter 13, we have the, the beginning of the first missionary experiences of Paul. And we were talking about this, how wow, what missionary experiences Paul has. I mean, we're talking, when I read them, I just think, what an amazing missionary. <laughs> and you know and the miracle after miracle after miracle. Missions are amazing, though. They I are. Mean, you have 12 right. kids. How many of your kids served missions, Mariana? Eight of my children. Eight, yeah, and so nine of mine have served missions, too. And believe me, they have amazing experiences. They do. Miracles. Astonishing, miraculous, unbelievable experiences. We highly recommend missions for oh, adventure I agree. and you know and, <laughs> and as well as life changing experiences like Paul life. has. And I will say this when when we read these, I was also thinking about how, for instance, each of these three missions that Paul went on, we're gonna talk about the first one right now when he goes to Antioch. They lasted about three years. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that, over three years of time, Luke is giving us the most amazing, 
you know, events that happened during those three years. Yes, exactly. And so I think, too, when a missionary goes off t- for two years or a mission president or mission leader goes off for three years, I promise it's you within bad, that bad, two bad. or three, d- during that two or three time- years, they'll have experiences almost as amazing yes. as Paul's experiences. It's so, so interesting. I hadn't noted the three years. Um, we went, years ago, I went to visit a, a member of our ward who was not very active, um, and but he had been very committed and involved and had served a mission. And when he had served missions, they were three-year missions. Right. They did. They so did used to be three years. That was also something that, that our... Yeah. The, re- the restored gospel do. did right three year missions. Well, the thing that I wanted to point out here in in Acts thirteen is there seems to be a pattern that happens here with this first missionary journey. That when he goes to Antioch, he does this wonderful missionary pattern, and he does this over and over again. When he's going to go to Thessalonia, Thessalonia, he's going to go to Ephesus, he's going to go to all these different ports all along the Mediterranean, these major cities. And I like to think about them as kind of like the New York and Chicago and Sao Paulo. Yes. These are these Ephesus these are huge. big. big uh, Antioch and Antioch was huge. These were these were the big you're right. They so, were that. so he wasn't going to tiny little Not villages. Yet. And I think sometimes we have that that wrong idea. You know, no, instead he's, metropolises. he's going to metropolises. And Paul, because of the way he was raised, would have been very um used to big cities. You know, he would have felt very much at home. So what he would do is the very first thing that he did was he always called upon the Holy Ghost. And I think that's significant for everybody's missionary journey, that they first have the Holy Ghost as their guide when they're seeking the help to find, you know, the people that are looking for the truth. And then after that, what he does is he finds the synagogue and he goes to the synagogue. And after reading the law, this is in verse 15, he then goes at the synagogue and he talks to the Jews first. And usually he goes to the Jews first. Oh, definitely. And he talks to them about their history. Which is the pattern of the Old Testament or the Tanakh, as we call it, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings, that um, in there is a reciting of the sacred history over and over. And Paul knows it inside out. Oh, definitely. As, do, as did Stephen. Um, and and he shares it with them. And during that sharing, he also brings up about how they are waiting for the Messiah and that he knows who the Messiah is. Yeah. And then he bears a strong and fervent testimony of the Savior, Jesus Christ. But he must have been, I boy, I would have loved to have heard Paul preach because he must be an incredible preacher. <laughs> because everybody responds to him. Oh, you know, I feel it when I read these sermons one after another. They're, and they are. They're a repetition of these stories we know. Right. But the power of it and the momentum. And he goes through each piece and lets his audience, the congregants, understand how it was pointing to something. And it has that what all of this work of God is pointing to has happened. Right. And you feel it. I'm so grateful to Luke for recording these things so beautifully because you, I almost feel like I'm there when I read it. Well, and then what happens is that people listen to him. So he's not just doing this and then people don't listen. No, he's usually, people love his words and they believe it. And so it says, and then when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them next Sunday. So, I mean, not only is beguiling Jewish people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but also the Gentiles. And now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. And so he has a large multitude that are all like, 
we believe your words. We're really appreciative of this. It must have been so powerful. It must have been so, and it, but you just know, full of the spirit. Think about it. Um, in our, we I can't help but draw parallels to the history of the the Church of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. of Latter Day Saints. There were times when missionaries would in England go and preach in congregations and whole congregations would believe. Exactly. I think they probably also laid out the whole march towards a need for a restoration and then explained that this had happened and people were like, people were like, yes, we believe. And that's exactly what happens here. And this is a pattern that goes over and over and over again with Paul as he goes to these major metropolis cities that he, you know, he starts in the synagogue, he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then the Gentiles also follow him. But this next part also happens every single time. Yep. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And they spake against things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Really, truly, they were because they, but they, you know, they had an institution to protect, they felt. Exactly. And they, you know, and that is something we all have to be careful of. Sometimes our institutions become more important than the fundamental premises upon which those institutions were based. That can be in education, that can be in faith, that can be in government. That, you know, these institutions have been established, our government was established to preserve peace and freedom. But sometimes it's all about preserving the institution. And we have schools so kids could learn to read and to learn and to appreciate the world. But sometimes it's all about preserving the money for the buildings and for the... And in religions as religion as well, we have to be sure that we are keeping our heart open to the spirit of the Holy Ghost and to the things that the Lord not only has revealed, does reveal, and will yet reveal. So we're going to see this pattern happens over and over again where Paul is extremely successful. And because of that success, he's going to be kicked out of city after city and stoned even at one point where he's risen from the dead. Um, As I was thinking about Paul and these missionary journeys that we're talking about, I also thought of Alma talking to his son Shiblon, who was a great missionary. And this is what he said. And I thought, I wanted to ask you what your thought was. How does this compare to Paul? He says, and now as you have begun to teach the word, even so I would that you should continue to teach, and I would that you would be diligent and temperate in all things. See that you are not lifted up unto pride. Yea, see that you do not boast in your own wisdom, nor of your much strength. Use boldness, but not overbearance. So. Do you see uh, these same things in Paul? Oh, yes, in Paul and in, in some of the other missionaries, too. And Barnabas you know, it, and yeah, I love himself. Barnabas. And with, let, I, first, let's talk about that, and that is that, you know, in some of these situations, as you know, I mean, there were people were, he would heal, and there was enormous awe, and people were at one point thought that he was Mercury. And, right, he, and, he was one um, of the gods. One of the other gods come right. down, and they wanted to celebrate them. They brought, And he... He says to them, as he does to others, to kings and others, I am just a man. Mm -hmm. I am this, I will keep telling this story, but I'm telling the story by the power of the Holy Ghost. And that power comes from Jesus Christ. He is very careful to attribute these things to the Savior. And, And nevertheless, they have troubles amongst themselves, the missionaries do, you know, which I think as I know that Mariana, you were the wife of a mission president, which means you were the other mission president. I'm sure there were <laughs> lots of, lots of challenges and wonderful. Well, we loved it. Lo- Lo- wonderful loved young people and, and wonderful. And yes, missionaries are our children. We and yet them. I'm sure there were also issues that you had to deal with, you know, on a le- relatively That's part ongoing. of a mission too ongoing basis. And we see that pattern Mm -hmm. here. Definitely. That they were humble. They were not, as Shiblon was advised by his 
father so wisely, not to try to take the glory to himself exactly. and not to speak on his own, but to wait for inspiration, you know, and that's what they, I think, sought to do. And then the other scripture that I would read to our missionaries for them to remember, and I thought of this scripture when I thought of Paul and his missionary journeys, where this is section 33, and this is Joseph Smith um, talking to some missionaries that are, are leaving to go on their missions here during the restoration time, where he says, open your mouths and they shall be filled. And you shall become even as Nephi of old who journeyed from Jerusalem in the wilderness. Yea, open your mouths and spare not, and you shall be laden with sheaves upon your backs. For lo, I am with you. Yea, open your mouths and they shall be filled, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, and prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I love that because... Paul definitely did not have a problem with opening his mouth. <laughs> Paul was good at that. Paul, he was very good at that. He was naturally disposed, probably, because he was, you know, before... He was he, an orator he, before. And he was he was a passionate person. And, and that is... And the Lord knew that Paul would be able to carry this message forward. And that's why even though Paul was there with those who stoned Stephen, even though he was going to gather up Christians and haul them in to, you know, to Jerusalem to be, to be locked up or worse, the Lord knew his heart and he knew that his heart was right mm -hmm. with God. His heart had a desire to do God's will. And that is why he chose him to be this person. I agree. In chapter 14, that's the, the whole point that you were making. As a matter of fact, if you go to verse 11, and when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And so, uh, you know, Barnabas must be Jupiter and Paul, Mercury, and, you know. Because Paul talked, you know, Mercury was, he was the messenger <laughs> of the gods. So they, Barnabas Chief speaker. must have been such a lovely person. You know, it means Bar not, but it means son of encouragement. His name means son of of encouragement. Bar, bar means son in Hebrew, ben or bar. And, um, and um, I love that they decided Paul must be Mercury because he was definitely the one who was talking. Was speaker. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely was. And then we have this idea where, like I said, he comes and he makes a splash. And then the people turn on him because too many people are listening to him. And what's going to happen? Their institutions will be disrupted. You know, that exactly. is their inst and when they and they are of the world, mm -hmm. not of the spirit, and of the world, you're worried about institutions a lot. And so we have this point where um they stoned Paul here. And, and they drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. But hallelujah, he's not. <laughs> I wondered if he was and he smart comes and back. He acted dead. He might have been, you know. The Lord may have told him, you know, stay down, stay down, stay down. don't do anything. You know? Well, and and I'm so glad you talked about that concept of they are protecting their institutions because then we come to chapter 15, where we have within the church people who are trying to protect yes. the institution of the church of what they thought the church was supposed to be. That's right. And so... Which we experience that, you know, when when our prophets sometimes push the windows open and push the borders out of the church. There are people in the church who are like, what are you doing? And we know that that's happened even when there were things like the long-awaited for many of us and hoped and prayed, lifting of the priesthood Definitely. restrictions. There were many people in the church who were it was hard. confused by that. Yeah. And I'm sure there will be many other changes, even now, when when our prophet has reduced the amount of time that we're spending in church on Sundays. Yeah. Um, when the, there are people who really miss it. Mm -hmm. I think it's we we in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, maybe more than the average member followers of Jesus Christ can understand these things because our church provides much of the same, I mean, similar thing. It's a, a wonderful social place where people come together and they love being together and they want that time. 
And so even though our prophet says, no, you know, we need to strengthen ourselves in our homes. Many people like, we like strengthening ourselves together, you know, but there are all these changes well, that help us understand the reluctance maybe of, of some, these people, of the um, leaders and faithful in the church to accept the changes that the Holy Spirit is going to invite them to institute. Well, and I and I think that's such a great point that we need to kind of put into context in that we are a worldwide church. The yes. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a worldwide church. Thrillingly and, worldwide. And, which is so fabulous. But then sometimes the way things are being changed is not just for people in Utah or even people in the United States, but so that we can be a worldwide church. And so some of these so, things that yes. that traditions that we have had, that the church has had, might need to be changed so that the church can go forth throughout all the world. And, and t- take the essence of the gospel, which is what the gospel exactly. is about, not the culture of the Intermountain West, you know, which has also been what the church was in many ways about because it this became its nucleus. But that culture but it's is changing not. now. And yeah. and we need to be aware of that's that. That's right. It's changing dramatically and that's wonderful. It because is because it the is gospel wonderful. is as as we read in these chapters, it is for everyone. So in chapter fifteen we have the Jerusalem conference. And for me, this is a a fascinating chapter, especially given the wonderful talk that we just had at last conference by President Nelson on being a peacemaker. And so after rereading that wonderful talk and then rereading chapter 15, it brought to mind this idea of being a peacemaker and who was the peacemaker during this time. And I think we're going to see that basically... James, the stepbrother of Jesus Christ, really becomes the peacemaker during this this interesting discussion that we're having, where members of the church there in Jerusalem, basically Paul comes back from this amazing first missionary journey, and he even brings some of his converts with him. And as they're talking, they're they're talking about how all these Gentiles are joining the church and how they're getting the Holy Ghost and they're being baptized. And and I'm sure, like you were saying, some of these people there in Jerusalem are going, wait, whoa, what's what's going on? You know, to be a good Jew, which this is a part of to them, right? You have a lot of things you gotta do, and these guys aren't doing them. And they're not being, you know, they're not being circumcised, and all these things are happening. And, and so and what they eat and what they, I mean, there's so many things. And so these Judaizers, how do you say that word? Judaizers. 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 Ju- mm-hmm. They are, you know, basically coming to them and saying that this is going to happen. Well, James comes to them and I can just imagine they're, they're really both have a good point. And he lets them talk. I love this. It begins in, in verse 13. And after they had, and after they had held their peace, first you know he listens Listen to, to everybody. He lets them talk. Sometimes I have to remember that as a mom. <laughs> it's like I don't even want to hear it. Just be quiet. <laughs> Do what I say. But he listens to them, and then James answers and says, "Men and brethren, hearken, hearken unto, unto me. me." And he comes up with a, a pretty good, you know way of fixing this. He says, wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, in that he's saying, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So he's saying, you know, we shouldn't trouble them. And I can imagine being circumcised as an adult man, that would be troubling men. <laughs> says, none of us had to do that. None you know, of us had did to it as a baby, adults, you know, yeah. as an adult. It's a lot easier as a baby, you know, right. I mean, having yeah. seen a number of boys circumcised, oh, it definitely. was not a big deal when they're little. You know, well, it's, but, that was a big deal for them when they're little. <laughs> well, they, mine, I, I was I stayed really close. I mine hardly cried because I just let them nurse right away. Oh, that's a good tip. That's right. That's just, a good tip. <laughs> you know, and and so they hardly even cried. But but um, that would be trouble. 
it would be major if it, you're a It would be guy very, very difficult. To do that. Yeah. So instead, he says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Which is interesting because the strangled, you know, that is a big part of kosher is that animals be killed in a humane way. way. And so this is, you know, he's saying, let's make sure that the animals are killed in a humane way. And then in 22, he says, Then pleased it the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And basically, he sent out to all of the different branches of the church and said, okay, this is the compromise. So that, you know, basically, the apostles made a decision and then they send it out to the church. And I, I think of the letters that oftentimes are read to us that are then signed by, you know, the First Presidency and the Apostles, and it's sent to all of the church for and them to know it. and read from the pulpit we really, so that everybody knows. We really do, if you are familiar with the church operating of the Latter-day Church, it is it does so follow. similar. It's, it's, it's stunningly similar. So I did want to share uh, just a couple of comments from our Latter-day Prophets about this chapter 15. President Ballard said, when we act in a united effort, we create spiritual synergism, which is increased effectiveness or achievement as a result of combined action or cooperation, the result of which is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And I love the fact that James, the stepbrother of the Savior, was the peacemaker that came up with this compromise that everybody as one could say, okay, you know, we're we're okay with this. This is a good Which, policy for the church to have as we move forward. And it sounds easier than I'm sure it was for many of them. Mm -hmm. But they they respected his authority, they respected his place, and they listened and understood that it, it made sense, maybe, not to put so many barriers before those who wanted to follow this great path. And then Elder Christofferson talked very specifically about this experience in chapter 15. But his point was he talked very specifically about how council deliberations will often include a weighing of canonized scripture, the teachings of church leaders, and past practice. But in the end, just as in the New Testament church, the objective is not simply consensus among council members, but revelation from God. It is a process involving both reason and faith for obtaining the mind and will of God. And that's what I think they came up with in this chapter 15. It was the mind and will of God. Yes. It wasn't just simply a compromise, mm -hmm. but it was what the Lord wanted because this is his church and he is still in charge. And how wonderful then and how wonderful for us now that we have living apostles and a prophet so that as much as we profoundly respect the scriptures, I mean, not only respect, but delight in and constantly learn from the scriptures, we have this extraordinary situation that are, that we have the that the authority is on earth to respond meaningfully to situations now, and that may mean doing things that are a little different. Definitely, sometimes. definitely. And I just want to end with this um, thought from President Nelson: in situations that are hardly highly charged and filled with contention. And I thought about this situation. I am sure people felt very strongly very. one way and one and the other. And yet I invite you to remember Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why I love the fact that James, the step yes. brother of brother. Jesus Christ, was the one that, that brought this idea. As we follow the Prince of Peace, we will become his peacemakers. Now is the time to lay aside bitterness. Now is the time to cease insisting that it is your way or no way. Now is the time to stop doing things that make others walk on eggshells for fear of upsetting you. If your verbal arsenal is filled with insults and accusations, 
Now is the time to put them away. You will arise as a spiritually strong man or woman of Christ. These are important words, important words. Uh, even though, as you know, I don't frequent the internet or social media. This is I consider it a shortcoming in some ways, but it also is liberating in other ways. I know that on that forum, there are many righteous and good individuals who speak in strong and sometimes forceful ways that may not be peace-promoting, you know? And I think that our prophet is asking us to be mindful of the ways that we present our ideas as worthy as they are, that we be we work to do them in a way that will promote peace. Well, I hope and pray that all of us can be peacemakers just like James was in this highly charged and difficult situation and really be able to think, what is it that Christ wants us to do in this situation? How can we help others to come unto Christ even in times of conflict or when other people don't believe the same way that we do, that we still need to be able to reach out our arms and say, you know, how can I make this situation a peaceful one? And maybe what do I need to let go of that seems vital to what God wants? What do I need to at least open my palm and and my ears and listen? Because maybe, maybe we can find a middle path that will be pleasing to God and and to the progress of his kingdom. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Annette. This has been such a wonderful conversation. And I so appreciate the fact that when we think about our Savior, Jesus Christ, he will bring peace into our lives. Thank you. It is a great gift to all of us. Thank you for watching Women Read Scripture. We hope to hear from you. Please write your comments below. Also, subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you again.